Hello and welcome to the Business of the Business Podcast. I'm your co-host, JP Ajapaz from the Two Man Power Trip. Joining me is Mr. Trump Mania himself, Mr. Lobby Margolin. Lobby, what's going on today, sir? Well, it's Donald Trump's universe and we're just living in it. So here we go again. Uh, we're in the uh, president-elect phase. So uh, come what may, I guess. Uh, uh, a lot of people uh, celebrating uh a fair amount of people around me nervous here in the New York City area. So uh, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, pick up your copy of Trump Mania on, on Amazon. Now, audio edition, which is um, not me. But um, Amazon has like ACX where they do like uh, audio, which is mostly good. Like uh, sometimes they don't, just don't know how to pronounce things because, you know, with, you sort of have to know the person. So like. Ockerland, Gene Ockerland, uh, that yes, sort of thing. Yes. But, it, but if you can get past that, I think it's enjoyable read. I bought one each for the audio, so just so I could hear it through once, uh, at least. Not to get too political, but man, they were saying a Republican would never win the popular vote again, and he did. I, I, I was shocked by that too. So, man, uh, you know, congrats and kudos to, to Trump. Not only did he win, he won the, the popular election too. So, my theory and there's so many different things that will come out would be that there's a lot of single issue voters whatever mm. your issue may be yeah um you know it's it's something that you're especially passionate about and trump was good at sort of like you know uh finding those people but also the uh, the dude vote which of course john we talked about extensively in uh, the yes. trump mania miniseries yep. but he certainly went for the dude vote with uh joe rogan Hulk Hogan, Undertaker, <laughs> all the people we like. For me, yep. um, uh, as we're about to talk about Barry Horowitz in a moment, Barry Horowitz had yes. certain trunks, certain symbol on it. So I was a uh, single issue voter this time. <laughs> Nice, nice. As far as Horowitz is concerned, I love that he's going to be the first thing we talk about because he's a number one bestseller right now with his book, correct? Or am I crazy? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, with Amazon, it's always like a moment in time. So I was like, oh, yes, let me yes. see how the book is doing. So it was, it was number one. So I like grabbed that, cut that screenshot. And and here we are. Um, uh, uh, Tyrus seems to be dominating the uh, the top of the Amazon wrestling charts for years and years and years, yes. um, which is like a story no one wants to tell, but it's an amazing story. However, Barry Horowitz, wrestling is my gimmick. So first of all, this is the lens of like, Jewish kid growing up, loving pro wrestling, not necessarily realizing like Dean Malenko was Jewish. Um, I heard the name Glenn Jacobs. I'm like, is he Jewish? He's not. Um, <laughs> Randy Savage is, depending on how you define Judaism. Uh, we usually do by right. the mother. But that wasn't yep. – I love Randy Savage, but not because he was Jewish. And Goldberg was not yet around. Um, so right. right, so late 80s and, and beyond. So – I always looked up to Barry Horowitz, um, so big fan. So I was so excited when this book came out. Now, the book I'm going to compare it to, it doesn't hold up so well in modern times. But to me, it was a book that I loved, and that reminds me the most of it. John, did you ever read Arne Anderson's first book? Not the graphic novel, but the yeah, one. The small Arne one. Anderson, yeah, the small, uh, thin one, right? Arne Anderson Forever. Um, yep. This is what reminds me of it. It's very... Like, it's not, this book isn't cafe, but it's kind of light, like where he's kind of, for the most part, going through his life in the in the wrestling world. And like, he has like a little bit of comments on it. It feels sort of like he's like doing a, a long form interview. Um, of course, he had a, a co-author with the book, but like, it feels like he's a long form interview and he's like fairly opinionated. But like, for the most part, it's smooth and it's interesting. And I even learned some things like about Barry's time in Florida. I have to go back and watch some of those videos. Um, and um, unfortunately, I learned some difficulties in his life. Um, uh, he had actually lost uh, a child um, at some point. Um, so that's that's very wow. tragic. Um, you know, anyone that has to experience that, obviously. So um, the book's expensive. It's $29.95 for a soft cover, and it's about 220 pages. But for me, <laughs> very hard fan. Two pats on the back. Yes. <laughs> Recommended. Yes. yes. To me, such an underrated worker. Man, he was great. Go back and watch uh, his matches with Owen, especially. Man, it's like, what a, what a clinic. Awesome wrestler. 
100% agree. And my favorite series with Owen is when Owen is the blue blazer, when he first, the first time he yes. comes into WWF, yep. those house shows. Yes. Um, I think you ever see the Z one... channel one from LA. That one's exactly. awesome. It's like 20 minutes. Yes. hundred percent. They just had like a, a great chemistry right away. And, and that is like quintessential Barry Horowitz. Um, love Owen Hart, of course. Um, definitely recommend that. Now, going back into politics a little bit here, what are we doing on this show? We're doing wrestling and politics. What is the <laughs> latest in the world of politics? Yeah, you know, John, I'm getting a little feisty on uh, on X, and I, I think I lost five followers, but, but I'll recover. Oh. <laughs> so um, first I said, are the political beliefs of promoters of independent wrestling promotions you follow important to you? I'll explain this more in a minute. But, right, right. Um, so a, a small response rate, but 22% said yes, 50% said no. And uh, twenty seven percent said uh, said maybe. Um, so um, you know this is uh, an interesting issue because um, this promotion called uh, Blitz Blitzkrieg Pro Wrestling out of Connecticut um, canceled uh, Jake Hager. Um, he was the first victim of uh, post election wrestling cancel culture, and I was joking that. Um, he is also the next NWA uh, world champion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Blitzkrieg Pro wrote that Jake Hager will no longer be appearing on December 14th. Uh, on top of sponsors no longer being willing to work with him, we also just have to do what we think is right for our roster and fans. We're going to get to work on a replacement ASAP. Uh what was it? Hager said that Tony Khan is like a communist, which is kind of funny because his his father is like one of the wealthiest people in the world. Um, yes. But I don't know. Like he didn't hurt any. Like he might have offended some people, but he didn't hurt anyone. Or whatever. But the uh, the irony here, and uh, maybe I'm going to Feeny territory, John. You'll have to uh, get, keep him up to date here. The irony here is that this promotion is called Blitzkrieg Pro now. The term Blitzkrieg is most associated with Nazi Germany's yes. lightning, right? It means lightning war uh, in Germany. And it was a strategy to uh, avoid a long war in the first phase of World War II. Um, just like basically like um, bomb the crap out of uh, certain cities. And I know obviously like we all remember Blitzkrieg from WCW. He was just there. Yes. Was it weeks or awesome. months? Awesome. And then he retired months, to become yeah, awesome. months to become like a computer technician, which good for him. You know, everyone do whatever they want. So like, yes, in wrestling, we fit think of Blitzkrieg from that first. But like, uh, you know, WCW wasn't that careful with names, right? What was they? They, they had like the final solution was like somebody till they till they realized later. So a lot of that sort of thing. And, and then it became the ultimate solution. Yeah, the ultimate yep. solution. So I know that there yep. was years between and Blitzkrieg came in with his own name, but. You know, but the first, I don't know if it was a mistake or what from WCW. Um, I'm still like a little bit like whatever when I hear like Elimination Chamber, like, you know, it's, it feels like weird to me. But for a promotion that's, you know, so sensitive to give themselves the name, I think they like should be a little bit more careful, you know? My only thing was, I know if the sponsors don't want to work with them, then obviously you pull them because you don't want to lose the sponsors and then you find a replacement. I know, I know how that works, but it's like, you don't want to alienate, especially if you're a smaller wrestling post, you don't want to alienate any fans. So, you know what I mean? You don't want to just, Oh, if, if you believe this, so we, we don't want you in our shows, like a slippery slope for sure. But if the sponsors obviously don't want him in, you, you just you can't, you can't because then you lose the sponsor. Yeah. There's like so many people that are like, watching pro wrestling they're ready to like cancel so many people like people yeah, are in the independence because like not saying that there's something missing but like people are passing through for all different reasons some of them are because of their spotty backgrounds right like so if you're not right. willing to work with some of the talent like and obviously you have a certain choice if i was promoting some i would work with some i would not but like to constantly like hammer these people and like go after them whereas you give other people a pass like it just you know it doesn't seem uh doesn't seem right to me and finally um you know with uh politics and pro wrestling and then we'll uh we'll move on um just a reminder and i think that he there had been indications that like sort of like he had changed his mind at a certain point but 
uh, Shahid Khan, Chad Khan was among the NFL owners that gave a million dollars to Trump's inauguration. Like, you know, I mean, obviously his, his first one when he was, yep. uh, inaugurated but uh, aw had like a uh, an election day special it's interesting because they had i think what was it like 40 percent off some shows for election day and then they had like yes. another promotion running with new japan 30 percent off for like the shows uh, including providence which only drew like 2500 which we'll talk about i think later um so yeah so your, that's a your politics. favorite area yep your favorite um, area yep. <laughs> yes for sure. Um, but if you are uh, not uh, turned off by such uh, talk and, and you have a demand for uh, Trump mania's return, uh, let us know. Yes, yes. So as far as P uh, Pro Wrestling Insider, this this is very interesting. I know we'll, we'll talk about uh, PWI as well, different PWI than, than Pro Wrestling Insider. But talk to me just about what's going on with the uh, wrestling media and uh, I guess maybe start with PWI and then go to Pro Wrestling Insider. Yeah. John, it's funny, like till you said it, I didn't even realize it was like the same acronym. Um, right, right. So, right. So like I know I'm the only person in the world, but the thing that I enjoy most about Pro Wrestling Illustrated that I subscribe to uh, off and on, um, usually when my subscription lapses, a few months later they send me like a great deal. So I actually signed up for two years. Um, is every every magazine and publication, and um, it used to be comic books too, when they were mailed, anything that goes through the mail is like a publication, you have to have a uh, statement of ownership. And you have to show, like, based on the issue that we're examining, um, how many copies sold and so on. And then it gives you a comparison point um, for previous years. So, um, I know we've talked about this about three times on the show, but I, I've lost some of those years. But um, in terms of the, the physical copies of the magazine, the issue that they were looking at, 9,184 copies. So you think like PWI, like every, like it seemed like it was like an obsolete thing, right? There's newsletters and then there's websites. But now um, like almost every performer talks about their ranking right like pwi probably smartly gives them the heads up like however many days before with a picture and whatever so they could promote it but you think the magazine would be doing better but two years ago was thirteen thousand copies so that's a 25 percent drop in physical copies sold we don't know how many digital copies they're selling um uh, what is it, McIlvaney, Kevin McIlvaney, seems like he's doing a great job. It's it's an engaging magazine, but at least in terms of the print, people aren't going for it. Um, so I hope it, you know, I hope it continues not to cause alarm, but we're just looking at the numbers here. But I think a lot of people get the digital copies now. Like almost every issue is like a hot shot issue, right? Like there's not many now where they're not like 500, women's, you know, it's been growing, which is a good idea. I think women's 250 or 300, top tag teams, awards issue. There's not like too many where it's just like, here's a regular issue. Now, the other thing um, not only affects PW Insider, but the field as well. A lot of websites, I'm not sure if you're seeing this, John, like not even not in, in pro wrestling, like where you'll go there and they'll be like, it looks like you're using ad blocker. Um, unless you disable ad blocking, like you can't access the content. So it seems like, you know, they're having, not getting as much advertising dollars um, as they'd like to. So I don't know if it's you know, to make more money or just to be able to keep things going. Um, you know, this is something that's restricted. So PW Insider, they, you know, they've always been annoying with the ads and sort of like some of the paid ads as well in the in the content advertorials. But um, but they do break some important information sometimes. So I do look at it, you know, on my phone because on my desktop, I don't want to disable any ads. Yeah, interesting there. Uh, so. As far as West Side Gun is concerned, what in the world is he doing in pro wrestling? Or what's his association with wrestling? What's going on with him and Zilla Fatu? Yeah, I think um, I think last time we said, like, who is this West Side Gun? I'm not sure I even know <laughs> much better. I understand now right. though, that he's, he's a rapper out of Buffalo. He loves pro wrestling. He's made a lot of money with rap music. He's a designer. Um, and he had this show that I don't know if the tickets were sold separately or, you know, it was all wrapped into one, but um, 
his fourth rope brand had a wrestling show and uh, Zila Fatu was the champion. So uh, was uh, crowned the champion. So that's a really smart move there. But um, just pulling a uh, an article, unfortunately, I didn't say which publication, but everyone can look it up. The title is Hip Hop Wrestling Collide at Westside Guns Heels Have Eyes at the UIC Pavil Forum. Um, <laughs> Hip Hop's music influence on pro wrestling goes back decades. Okay, let me skip that. Uh, Buffalo, New York rapper Gunn, who grew up as an avid fan and front row fixture at many wrestling promotions, appears to have a the gravitas, and most importantly, the financial backing to pull off Fourth Rope, a wrestling promotion that's aligned with his concert series, Heels Have Eyes, along with his new album, Still Praying. The event, which took place last weekend, featured musical performances, DJ Premier, Pete Rock, and so on, in ring, and they brought in a lot of TNA wrestlers, Moose, Henry, Slamovich, Francis, Santana, Grace, along with Zila Fatu and Cha Cha Charlie. It's not a shock that Gunn, who might be pro wrestling's most influential evangelist alongside Wale, would parlay his fandom into creating something more tangible along with his music. Um, some of his songs include Gorilla Monsoon and the Dudley Boys. Phil Lindsay, a wrestling con. Okay, so this just felt like a logical next step for him in a lot of ways because he was showing up at all the wrestling shows and he was showing that he was a hardcore fan. He talked a lot about wanting to be acknowledged by some of these companies like WWE. It just felt like for him, he wanted to be hands-on wrestling more. It just felt like it was only a matter of time. Um, Gunn successfully amalgamated his interests under one roof, his music, um, his merchandise. Also, the wrestling personalities were hyper-aware of the moment's history. Um, fourth Rope, uh, MVP uh, seemed like he was making the call from inside the house. Recently, there's been a lot of talk regarding how the WWE doesn't create storylines for black male talent. Um, wrestling scribes have pointed out the apps. Okay, so they go off onto um, that issue in terms of um, uh, black male performers in pro wrestling. Um, let's see, though. Uh, TNA wrestler Francis was on last Saturday's card. Uh, the marking genius of West is not just it's a sold-out show. It's a sold-out wrestling show named after the album he just dropped. It's also talking about the show and so on and so on. So the music um, connection to pro wrestling continues. Um, it always seems like it'll be like a way to like jumpstart and promotions with those monies do seem to get ahead. But it never like has gone to like a super high level, right? We've seen NWA which we'll, we'll talk about. They're doing their thing. Obviously, our, our friend uh, of the uh, Violent J of the Insane Clown Posse, they have their thing um, going. Um, Wale Mania, um, and I'm sure others. So it's like, it's more of a, I would say like more of like a curiosity and a secondary thing to performers um, rather than like it being a launching pad for like a really big promotion just historically. So as far as GC Dub is concerned, what's going on with them? I know they're going to Hawaii of all places. Yeah, so they were um, just in Hawaii, and I don't know if they like moved the room in the convention center. That was the original space. It was a small room that you know in the photos I seen looked full, but I think it was just um, from watching the events uh, bright or the event space that it was um, just a few rows deep, and that's uh, a long, uh, as Barry Horowitz might say, a long schlep. To Hawaii for selling just a few rows of tickets. I know that they were in um, San Diego just a couple of days before, and a lot of the talent were, were enjoying that opportunity to uh, to hit Hawaii beaches. And Brett Lauderdale wants to get to all fifty states and all of that, but it just seems like uh, an expensive proposition. So, looking forward to to learning more about that in the future. Um, in my opinion. Uh, GCW's stellar success of the last few months is th this American Dream small show that's uh, that's upcoming. Every time they put more tickets on sale, uh, it seems to to sell out. Um, they put some more um, third tier of of the mall, I guess uh, GA, but it'll be blocked off, so it's not that you could just stand there, but that you'll have a blocked off section that shouldn't be that should be unobstructed. Those seem to have sold out as well. So really curious uh, about the numbers there. John, have you, are you considering going to that one? Yes, for sure. I'm thinking about it. it just depends on what the, what the wife and kids are up to, but I definitely want to. 
Well, you know, it, it depends how you position it. You, you you could be like, do you want to spend the day in the mall? Yeah, and, true, uh, true. Who would who would decline that? You just be like, I just have to uh, to step away for these uh, three hours, or maybe you know, let's let's watch the show and then we can. Uh, I know that there's like carts where you could drive around the mall. I've heard a lot of good things. My family has gone. Yeah, by. I haven't yet gone. Um, oh, it's huge! It's gigantic. Um. And uh, they just announced the show, I believe, with Progress um, in the Electric Ballroom in London. So uh, that's another feather in their cap. And I don't know, you know, how the whole process works in terms of like working visas as like entertainment, you know, or sports when you're when you're passing through these countries. But it seems like a lot of work, a lot of coordination to get there. But certainly the GCW crew isn't afraid of whatever it takes to get out there. So um, I think we've been deep diving into, you know, GC. W and, and so on upcoming shows uh for a while so we'll take a little break from that this week and and come and focus on some other things why don't we focus on perhaps our favorite guest perhaps disco inferno's favorite person of all time mr kevin kleinrock mr mash republic what's going on kevin how's it going guys hey kevin how are you Good. I'm I'm just trying to get that same number of appearances as Brett. Like that's all. That's my goal here, right? I gotta. He's still beating me. Now it depends how we how we parse this out. A number of our guests, as you know, Kevin, have roots in um, you know upstate New York. Now you're on the West Coast, yep. Which which complicates our math, but <laughs> but you're certainly. I think you're far and away. Uh, the leader on the West Coast board, and you're moving right. up quickly in the all-time leaderboard. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll accept that for now. And Keep in mind, Lavi books the guests. Keep that in mind. So it's it's up to him. And we appreciate you didn't celebrate the Dodgers winning the World Series that much, or, or that I noticed on, on Facebook. That was very kind of you. No, I mean I grew up in LA, a Dodgers fan, and and would go to Dodgers games, but uh, I I my lack of following traditional sports um it keeps me from <laughs> from being too uh, uh attached to any one team's wins or losses fair enough so what's going on and what's the latest with mast republic oh lord where do we begin um well we finally announced and we had announced the, the middle grade book series a while ago but um just shortly ago we finally revealed the cover for our middle grade book series with uh, the Munoz dynasty, Dragon Lee, Rouge, and uh, Drillistico, along with their father, uh, El Toro Blanco, now known as Bestia del Ring. Um, so that is something that I am extremely excited about, um, being able to get this middle grade adventure novel in, in English and Spanish out to uh, people in March. March 10th is our official release date for that. Um, and just one more one more avenue that Mass Republic is taking to expand Lucha Libre beyond the borders of Mexico in, in every way possible. Um, so that's, that's been really exciting. And then, you know, we continue developing a plethora of uh, entertainment from preschool to adult. We have our, I think since last we talked, because okay, this was just last month, um, our second comic book, from Master of Public Comics, uh, Vampiro Rockabilly Apocalypse launched, and we are the response to that one has been phenomenal. Um, there, other than the fact that his driver is kind of, for lack of a better way of putting it, getaway driver, even though he's not necessarily getting away from anything bad, he's just trying to outrun uh, the the apocalypse. Um, uh, she she is a luchadora from a luchador family, but uh, you know, Vampiro is not a luchador really in in this series. He is a rock and roll icon, and uh, he just happens to be in the middle of the apocalypse uh, impending uh, across uh, our 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 world and and trying to stop it from happening. So um, we're we're excited about that one and the feedback we've received there. And uh, our our Luchaverse relaunched, and the Luchaverse Catalyst one through three are in comic shops now, along with Vampiro number one. Um, and I think since last we talked, we did our first event with our partners at UTA for Masked Mania, and we went to a Burt Ogden Arena in Texas. Um, it was our first Master Republic Arena show, and let me tell you, we would love never to run somewhere that's not an arena again, because producing a show in an arena when the arena is your partner and they're taking care of 
the you know staging and the lights and the and the video screens and all that and you just show up and put on the best show you can it's a nice nice way to do business so uh you know we're we are not too spoiled to know that we won't be able to do that all the time but we are looking at uh hopefully a large number of shows with uh uta for the masked mania brand for 2025 and we'll hopefully have announcements before the end of the year of uh where we're going next Man, with Vampiro, it's interesting because he says he's going to retire, and then he's like more popular than ever right now. I mean, he's he's kind of like blowing up. It's one of those things where maybe he shouldn't retire. All this stuff's going on. Well, to be to be clear and fair, he is doing his Mexico farewell tour, um, and I don't expect to see him wrestling in Mexico again um, after the end of this year. But um, well, okay, of course, one is it's wrestling. So you know, will, will there be a a, a comeback uh, show or tour in another five years? Who knows? But um, uh, you know, he he is he is committed to you know this this last round of shows with with Triple A is uh, you know his goodbye in every city, um, and it's drawn extremely well and sold out pretty much everywhere it, it's been. Um, and after that, he's going to be spending more time in the United States. He's just got back um, right before New York Comic Con from Italy, where he's working again on a regular basis um, over there now. And but he's really dedicated to his projects outside of uh, pro wrestling. He has a podcast in Mexico. Um, obviously, it's listened to globally, but they're doing two million views on social media. Uh, you know, an episode for clips from their show. It's just completely blowing up. Um, you know, when he's doing his appearances at, at conventions and, and uh, the, like uh, San Diego Comic Con, New York Comic Con, um, people are coming up and talking about the podcast. And he you know, didn't necessarily expect that people outside of Mexico. It's in Spanish. Um, you know, we're listening to it, but it's really caught on. Um, it's a podcast about non wrestling stuff. He interviews musicians and actors and actresses and, and, and you know, politicians and all, all sorts of, of pop culture people. Um, but yeah, he's he's got a number of other projects that are lined up, um, and we're obviously hoping that uh, the comic book uh, series is going to lead in other directions as well. So uh, he will he will be busy after his Mexico in ring retirement. That is for sure. And the NWA, and work- he's, doing, he's working for the NWA here and 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 making appearances, and that won't be that won't be stopping. Um, you know, I, I don't know that he'll be wrestling per se so much but uh he'll he's he's uh enjoying his time with and uh and looking forward to continuing with the nwa and i know your boy latin lovers killing it too uh, in the podcast game right he's is he killing it yeah he yeah he's got a, a a super popular podcast over there as well it really it 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 seems like the wrestler and i think you have to have the right personalities right latin lovers a, yeah. a a big personality who really is more popular in Mexico because of his telenovela and other um, non-wrestling appearances over the last you know few decades um, than uh, than he is for for wrestling at this point. Uh, but he's back in in AAA as well on camera as as a, a authority figure of sorts. Um, but yeah, there, there seems to be a really good formula for the right personality, but not talking about wrestling, <laughs> talking about other right. stuff. So right. with, with with Latin Lover, he does have a lot of luchadors come on the show and, yeah. and, and, and th- those, those interviews seem to, uh, you know, get buzzworthy. And, uh, you know, there's always, somebody's always saying something that's getting picked up by the press and, uh, and becoming, uh, yeah, a story in one way or another. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think he's, he's doing well with that. I know Conan was on and it did huge numbers too. And obviously they, they've had passed together, maybe a little bit yeah. of heat there, but yeah. 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 Well, listen, I think it's, it's wrestling. So, it's really hard to find two people who have been top of the card that haven't had heat with each other at some point, you know, in, yes, in their yes. career. Um, but yeah, no, they, uh, I know that Conan show did, did huge numbers. Um, as far as Walmart is concerned, I know they carry Max Republic, mm-hmm. right? I mean, how the, how the heck did that happen? That's awesome. So, you know, most of our products that we do these days are licensing deals. Um, you know, when we started out, we were, working with our friends who had, you know, silk screen presses and, and making shirts and selling them off of our website. But we knew about, I don't know, maybe about six years ago now, seven years ago now, we knew that if we wanted to really up our merchandising and licensing game, we were going to have to get into actual licensing of our, of our brands and our, and our talent. Um, 
and we started working with uh, you know, a number of agents that would help us accomplish those goals. And that's how we ended up with, you know, action figures and a, and a cookbook and um, a lot of the other fun stuff and cool products that we've done over the years. Uh, but this oppor opportunity came up because we have a relationship with a um, company called Mad Engine that does licensing for everyone from Disney on down, including WWE. Um, and they had an opportunity to pitch to uh, Walmart and they, they liked the shirt and which it's, it's, it's always pretty cool to us when our, just our company logo is chosen, uh, at, you know, to, to be the, the item or the shirt, um, for, for anything. And, and we we found that our, at our live events too, that our, our logo tends to sell pretty well, even up against, you know, some of the big name luchadors that we might have merch for, but, uh, yeah, Matt engine was able to, uh, get Walmart to take in the mass public logo shirt available across the country in stores that uh, Walmart has given their Hispanic kind of store label to, which is hundreds of stores. Um, and so right now you can find our logo shirt there for $8 and 98 cents. And so if you have a Walmart in your area, I would uh, appreciate it if you checked it out and let us know on social media, if they carry them in your area, but also, um, you know, not a bad deal. We've never sold our logo shirt for $8 and 98 cents. So um, hopefully it, it does well over the next few months. And I think it definitely could open the door for uh, apparel from you know the luchadors that we represent and, and other Lucha Libre associated uh, you know products, hopefully in Walmart. La V, I know you got some good questions for Kevin. That's Kevin. Um, just something that came randomly into my mind. We'll start out with something fun. Uh, you don't have to name names in terms of uh, the requester, but what was like the most random request you ever got to use Lucha Talent and why did you have to turn it down? Well, the most random request we didn't turn down. Um, the most random request was an email that I got. This is, a, this is going a number of years back. I got an email that I absolutely thought was a scam or, you know, like it just wasn't real. It was like, hey, we're doing this event for charity. Um, it's it's with this company called Charity Vision, and we you know provide um, eyeglasses and other sight related services to you know, countries that that can't provide it. Um, and we're doing a boxing match between uh, Mario Lopez and uh, Oscar De La Hoya, and um, we want you guys to come and do a lucha match oh yeah also mitt romney will be there and maybe you can do something with him <laughs> and i i almost didn't return that email because it seemed pretty far-fetched but wouldn't you know uh it was legit uh and we did that event and it was um oh god it, it was i'm pretty sure it was serpentico uh and uh uh an oraculo um who who did that show um that was probably the, the weirdest most random thing in terms of licensing i you know not so much things we've had to turn down but there's been a a fair amount of products that we did agree that we wanted to do but then for some reason fell through um from dog clothes to uh our own tequila which we'll get back to one day um absolutely but I'm trying to think of anything that, you know, maybe, maybe early on um, some cannabis related products. So we always, you know, offer up Conan for anything, uh, you know, that, that comes along uh, yeah, cannabis related. Um, oh yeah. But yeah. I don't think there's anything we've, we've like rejected designs for t-shirts or, you know, different ideas that people have had within, but I can't think of a product so far that we've just, flat out rejected but if i think about it you know cool uh, i appreciate the mitt romney story i actually remember that situation and i never linked it back to you so small world i love it um how and and forgive me for the pronunciations i'm, I'm doing my best how is el hijo del vikingo doing ah vikingo i thought pretty good hijo del vikingo uh he's doing all right he's doing all right um it seems like so the injury was to the knee or to the, the, the leg that he had uh, surgery on. So that was the real scary part was, you know, did he just do damage where he just had been healing from? Um, and it seems like it was more of a, a sprain. Um, 
just because of, of how he, he landed. And I would assume everything goes according to plan. He'll be back in action, you know, in about a month or so. Um, I'm sure that he's going to make sure that he's, he's ready to come back. Uh, or I should say maybe others will make sure that he's ready to come back. Cause you know, I think we've seen that he is not one to hold back and, and not one. To, he's a, you know, it's the Brian Danielson, you know, type of, uh, uh, of, of situation, right? When he goes in the ring, he's, he, he doesn't have a half speed. He can't give, you know, half of who he is. He's got to go full speed. And, uh, and so I think that, um, sometimes he has to rely on the others around him to make sure that he's not pushing it too far, too fast. But, um, I do expect that, you know, hopefully by the end of the year, uh, he'll be he'll be back in action. So, not saying you have insider information, but you uh, would probably be better at giving a, giving a go at at helping us solve it. What is going on with JBL and AAA? Uh, so, I, I well, first off, JBL showing up everywhere, right? I mean, like JBL, it's not that they're all connected, right? I mean, yes, uh, uh. AAA does business with um, TNA, and yes, up every. Sorry, I, I looked like I cut out there for a second. Um, he's showing up everywhere. He's in GCW. He's in here. He's in there. So, what's going on with JBL, <laughs> and what what is he thinking about his career at this stage? I think is a really interesting story right now um, because you know, the, part of it has got to be fun. Because the man has done very well for himself financially, um, you know, not just from what he made in wrestling, but I know he's he's been very wise with investments, and and so I can't imagine that he's doing this like you know some other people that might be doing this because they need to pick up you know a, a, a payday. Um, so I think he must be having fun, and he must be um, enjoying showing up and and wrecking havoc and and leaving. But um, I, honestly, I think that I. And again, I don't have any insider information. I'm looking at this from a fan perspective and from just following the business perspective. Um, I do believe that what AAA is putting out on television is really part of the real story. I think that they, you know, have always had an eye for the United States, and you know, they they've throughout time tried to approach coming into the U.S. from different angles and different ways of doing it, and I think that. This seems to be a, a creative story that will potentially bring them back into the U.S. and give a little bit of a reason um, for why uh, they're coming to the U.S. other than to you know bring Lucha Libre. Uh, but it is that now JBL is an investor and, and he and his partners can be the ones that, that bring them to the United States. So we'll see if uh, 2025 brings uh, some some uh, arena shows for, for AAA in, uh, in the U.S. They did. But uh, it's it's been a while since they've had a proper Triple A show here in the in the U.S. And so I think uh, I'm guessing that that legitimately is part of what's going on. So, given your relationship with them, like, have you gotten a call like they're like, hey, Kevin, I I know <laughs> I've seen this stuff at the UTA. Um, you know, I know you have big plans. We're we're good together, but can you chill because we we're, we kind of want to do our own thing. Like, how do you how do you navigate that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so Mass Republic sits in a really interesting spot because we are not just, or we're not a promotion, right? We do shows, but we're not, we our be all end all of who we are is not being a promotion. Um, and, and we have kind of become the go-to for helping companies in Mexico when they need to navigate the U.S., whether it's work visas, whether it's, um, you know, consulting on, on shows or whatever the case may be. Um, I think that, you know, really for us, because we always get the question. We get the question when we're pitching stuff or trying to set up a show or or whatever, you know, but it's not AAA, but it's not CMLL. So what is it? And why, why should we be working with you when there's these two big companies out there? And I think for us, that's why we have to come up with ways to differentiate our product and what we do. You know, Masked Mania is meant to be if you've never been to lucha libre at arena mexico what is it 
And how do I experience that? And that goes beyond the matches that we put on in the ring. It's, it's the experience of showing up in the arena and being able to meet the talent right there up close and personal. It's the food that served. It's what's going on in the parking lot before the show. So we are really building Masked Mania to be a Mexico-like experiential event that goes beyond what's happening in the ring. And I think that that leaves a great place in the market for AAA to come and for AAA to do shows because you're going to get on a AAA show what it is you see on AAA television. Um, and this, I mean, listen, this country is this country uh, has a lot of uh, venues, and I think that you know AAA coming here and running, even if they ran every weekend, that's only four markets a month, you know, or eight if they're doing double shots, they're going to be able to hit. So I don't think we're really worried. about about that i don't think they're really worried about that um you know even even if we both companies were on full-time national touring it's still such a big place with so many places to go and i think that the product that we're bringing right now in ring is what i like to call a sampler platter of lucha libre if you go to one of the mask mania shows you're getting a trios match you're getting a tag team match you're getting um uh minis you're getting everything that really you know is lucha libre and so I think that it often can even be complementary towards each other. Whereas if we're going to a market that maybe isn't as familiar with Lucha Libre and we go into a market six months before AAA, AAA brings their show or, I mean, you know, CMLL is never coming here to do a show of their own, but, you know, anybody else. I think really we can be opening eyes and creating fans to come to, you know, their shows. Um and vice versa. You know, if they hit a town first, we're bringing kind of a different approach to what a live Lucha event is than they are. And so, um, no, absolutely not. I can tell you, nobody has called us and asked us to chill. Um, and I do think that the big picture is we can work quite complimentary, complimentary, that's not even a word, but you know what I'm saying, uh, with, uh, with other groups coming in and around and, and really you know, have the same goal, which is to broaden Lucha in total in the United States and, and everywhere outside of Mexico. So, Kevin, you know me. I, I like the details, so I'm going to push you as much as I can, and, and you know how to push back. So let's see what we can do here. So with this um, uh, UTA agreement, right, you, you had this event. Uh, thousands of people were there. It looked great. So, like, what's what's the next step in terms of, like, are there – is there, like, a certain region identified? Are these going to be mid, mid-major mid arenas, which is a word that I wish Tony Khan knew a little bit better? No. <laughs> um, you know, what's, what's the advertising um, going to be? Is there going to be some sort of television support? Are you drawing from your ta- your main talent as the base? I think that's, that's enough color. <laughs> um. So it's funny because I'm going I'm to give you a, a word that I'm sure that you're familiar with at this point. Um, so UTA is a flywheel that we uh, sure are lucky to have tapped into. Um, it, UTA, I mean, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago and in the room were agents that represented live events. Uh, the Hispanic initiatives by UTA, um, gaming and uh, um, general general touring, who represents kind of musicians and and comedians, and you know, there there is a great opportunity here for us to really tap into people who specialize in live events and that think and are from outside of the wrestling space. And I think that you know it always requires a really delicate balance because we've seen things happen where people from outside of wrestling just assume that eh, I mean it's pro wrestling how hard can it be let's let's you know especially in the lucha space. You've seen a lot of um people who have promoted Hispanic concerts really well think that well if I can promote you know Hispanic concerts then lucha can't be that hard. And and it doesn't work unless you have really the right mix of people and the right voices being allowed to be heard. Um, and, and so that's one of the things that we're most excited about is we have somebody who is a full-time tour manager um, 
agent who's now going out and talking with arenas all over the country about bringing mass mania into those arenas. And we have another agent there who's part of this core mass mania group who is there to think about the brand overall and licensing opportunities. Um, there is somebody from the TV side, but I think that for 2025, the real focus is on the event. And, you know, we've done one. Um, it went great. We, we, uh, the, the, the show aspect of it was, was fantastic. Um, if you've seen, I think you mentioned seeing, you know, you've seen some of the footage, you've seen some of the, the clips, like it, it could not have gone better, uh, you know, from, from start of the show to end of the show. Uh, and then we got our heads back together and we talked about, you know, what are the other elements that we'd like to see and do? We had a whole plan of what we wanted to do um, outside the arena, but because of the weather, we weren't able to do anything outside of the arena. So we had to kind of change those plans at the last minute. But um, so I would say 2025, the experience, the, the, the focus is the live event experience and, and creating this event that people who like Lucha, who maybe have never been to Lucha, people who just want to go to a fun, different kind of cultural event, uh, people who might have watched uh, WCW Lucha, but, you know, haven't don't follow WWE or AEW today, but they're, you know, think it's cool to go see a uh, Juventud Guerrera and, you know, a, a Vampiro or whoever. Um, I, I think there's a lot of audiences for us to draw from. So that's the focus for 2025. Um, will there be a television element to it? At, maybe at some point. Um, and I think what that approach would be and how that would be is very, very up in the air. Um, I would say that we're not, the, the arena experience, um, this sampler platter works great because you can take that and you can move that from town to town to town. And yes, you are taking that traditional wrestling approach of let's, let's leave them with a bit of a story. So that if we come back around to this town, we can, uh, we can get in there and kind of, you know, do this rematch or do this stipulation match or whatever. Um, but the focus is not week to week to week storytelling. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for anyone to just jump in and watch this, this event. So that's the focus for 2025, but this is a, this is a long-term, you know, partnership, uh, uh, you know, joint venture that we are, we're not, what I love about working with UTA is nobody is rushing and everybody wants to take a step, analyze, tweak it what's next and to have partners who are willing to do that and to look long-term and build something, you know, over the, the next few years, I think that's going to be a great benefit to, uh, to all of us in the end, but very excited about getting back out in 2025 and, and hitting arena. Entry. Um, to your, to your question, we did have a call about markets and, and, and regions. And, um, that's what Joe, uh, uh the uh, touring agent at, uh, at UTA is, is focused on. Um, and I think we've got both places you'd, you'd expect, uh, you know, major Hispanic population centers on, on that roadmap. But we've also got some other uh, cities and towns where I don't know that they've ever had a full straight from Mexico Lucha Libre show. Um, but I think it's going to be really, uh, really fun to try to bring this experience there. And, uh, you know, we'll let you know as soon as, uh, as soon as we've got, uh, we've got more word there. I, I would say, that we're probably looking at the second half of 2025, just because you know the arenas and the venues that we're that we're trying to book. You know, this is a six to 12 months in advance, uh, you know, booking strategy, and not a uh, you know call them up a couple of weeks before and say, hey, we want to bring a show to town. Plus, to your point, we need, we need to market and advertise these well, and and that's always part of the conversation is how do we uh, how do we do that and what's the timing of that? No, I think it's interesting that like. Obviously, Lucha in Mexico has a very broad cultural appeal, but I think like to, just like for an entertainment purposes, I think it could travel like so much more than traditional pro wrestling. I'm taking my son to his first WWE show, the holiday show. Um, of course, um, 
And uh, he asked me about two two people he doesn't care about for wrestling. He asked me about two people, Bianca Belair, because she was in a video game as, as a downloadable character, and Jake Paul, just because he watches YouTube. Uh, but I think that I think he'll have a good experience, especially as John and I were talking about at $100 a ticket, uh, but uh, in the top tier. But, but, um, but I think, like, if he went to, like, um, a lar- like, a big production lucha show that like he would probably be like even more engaged to it so there's a lot of like possibilities there yeah absolutely 100 percent um so kevin i wanted to get your sense like my theory for for a few years is that the the super indie i'm not gonna say dead i don't want to be dramatic but like isn't what it used to be Meaning that, like, there's not a lot of Northeast wrestlings anymore, even though there still is Northeast wrestling, where they're like, okay, we're going to hit a market that is semi-major or, you know, that can draw a couple thousand people. If we bring together some names that people know from TV, just off TV, we can draw, we can make a lot of money, and everyone will be happy. I don't think that exists anymore. I think, like, GCW is that in some ways, but that's still, like, very niche and it's hard to gather that are you seeing that like in terms of talent bookings is there like is is there that still demand for like bringing in a number of talents to like these shows that aren't one of the the known brands or have you seen that dissipate a bit Uh, i mean that's a good question i think that i think that the there's so much more indie wrestling overall than there has ever been still. I mean, maybe post pandemic, it's been a little bit of a dip, but I still think that there are more shows happening, you know, in a given month than, than there were, you know, maybe back when the, when you could book a couple or, you know, four or five names and, and draw a few thousand people maybe to some of these bigger Northeast uh, type of shows. Um, you know, I I think some of it is really market dependent, meaning I think there's a lot of markets where you can, you, know, you can't just grab a handful of guys that just left WWE and take them to that town and think it's going to, it's going to draw. Um, but I do think that there are some markets where, where that you, you can still do that. Um, and we, we see that, but I, I, I would say that from my just my casual observation, it's definitely less than than it was. Um, I don't know if that goes to just the there's so many entertainment choices. And like you said, like the, there's there's a whole generation that's coming up now that doesn't really have an affinity for pro wrestling. And I think a lot of those kind of shows as you're describing those are families that were going out to those shows and buying four tickets, buying five tickets. And if you have your gen alpha or, uh, you know, uh, gen Z that are not fans. Um, and now we're kind of getting into a second generation of, uh, of people. I think it's gonna be harder for those family friendly big shows to really draw. Um, because the kids aren't like when I grew up, I was begging to go to wrestling, you know, and and I just don't I think it's a bigger picture question. Um, cause I still think our industry as a whole is doing a horrible job of creating new fans out of kids. Um, I, I think that we are at risk of that median age continuing to go past 60 and 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 as a as an industry as a whole, um, I wish that there was more being done to create young fans um and then maybe you would have those middle of america shows that could draw thousands again when uh when people leave wwe i don't know but um i i because we don't do like I, we hate booking out talent like that's not what we like to do um we don't like like we'd rather just have people call the call the talent direct for the most part i mean like for triple a we book vikingo and and there are a couple other people that that we will we will do that for but um because we aren't set up as a business to really be booking talent out like that. Um, I don't know that I've necessarily seen the exact um, kind of rise and fall as, as you've been observing, but I do think that overall, I think we're seeing a slowdown of shows like that. And 
I do wonder if, if a good part of that is that we're just, it's not the family thing to do right now. So before I was obsessive about pro wrestling stats, I was obsessive about comic book stats. And one of my favorite things in the, uh, the diamond, um, you know, previews was that they would have like, here's the top, 100 or even top actually at a certain point it was like top 300 best selling and they would actually give you like some some stats so kevin if you know if it's not appropriate to share the actual sales number i want to see if like i could get some comparables just to get a sense of like how the master of public comics have been selling and if they're going into second printings or more and if there's some plans for like trade paperbacks all right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't give necessarily like actual numbers. Um, you know, we're still, even though we are, we are with a great publisher called Massive Publishing. Um, you know, when you look at those charts, it's still Marvel, DC, Image, um, and those are, I mean, really, those are the the, the big ones. And the, and and honestly, depending on what chart you look at, if you're adding manga to that they're all kind of getting slaughtered <laughs> by, by manga these days. Um, uh, so, you know, I would say that we're very happy with the numbers, uh, you know, for us getting these comics into stores, uh, and Michael Kingston talks about this all the time, you know, both in terms of, of actually being able to get the comics and the stories, it's all about accessibility. We want people to be able to have and get to, we also want the stories to be very easy to jump into and to 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 follow along and and to become a fan of uh, without having to know anything else before you 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 pick up the the comics. Um, and so, uh, d definitely plan for trade paperbacks. Um, that's just kind of the the model that makes sense these days. Um, so I don't have a timeline for you right now for uh, the Luchaverse trade paperback um, and Vampiro. We've still got. We've still got five, four more issues to get out and start talking about the trade for that. Um, so it'll be a while. But yes, the plan is for, for trades. Um, we've got a multi-year plan mapped out here uh, for, for Master Public Comics, where, where things are kind of going to go and, and head both um, on the page and, and what we're hoping to accomplish off the page as, as things develop for television, um, video games, etc. So... Uh, you know, we we take a very transmedia approach to all IP in terms of you know the old approach to building an IP was you had your core whatever it was your TV show your movie or your your comic book your book and it became successful and then you licensed it to people to do with it what they would you know this is our interpretation for TV or this is our interpretation for a video game or if it is tv or video game our interpretation for uh something in published try to think about it holistically from the beginning and and have thoughts from the get-go of what will this look like for tv what will this look like for a video game what would this look like in in you know, licensed products um and so this is kind of step one uh the publishing side of it but it, I'm really proud of the books that we're putting out. We, the, the reviews of Vampiro have just been incredible. And if you looked at like the average reviews the week that uh, number one came out, it was higher than the average Marvel comic or the average DC or image comic for that week. So while we have an eye towards television, video games, et cetera, we're certainly not sacrificing what's on the page in the book for that. These are incredibly well-written comics incredible art in the comics. Um, and so we're just going to keep pushing on that. And and I do expect word of mouth to kind of grow, especially for Vampiro. Um, it, it's it's for people that like quirky uh, horror, um, you know, in the lines of like Evil Dead or um, uh, things of that nature. It's not it's not nearly as campy as Evil Dead, but uh, Michael Kingston writes a great Vampiro with lots of great quips and one-liners and and really captured the real vampiro's personality very well in it um and so yeah we're 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 satisfied with where the numbers are right now um we are expecting and hoping things to grow and i think that i don't know that for 
catalyst the luchaverse three that we did that we do a second printing of those we're, we'll, we'll roll that into a trade and the trade will be kind of the way to get it um with vampiro it's it's still kind of too early to tell um we are starting to run low at least on our end with the uh, stock on on number one um but it also ties back into like mask mania you know my my hope and goal is that as we are touring the show our merchandise stand is going to be unlike any other merchandise stand in in, in a, at a wrestling show because of the variety of uh, products that we offer. So you'll be able to come to the show and pick up a Vampiro comic book and hopefully you know get it autographed by him in in person. You'll be able to uh, you know pick up our our, our tabletop game uh, that we have coming out, uh, which is the first of its kind. I don't think I have it here right now. I was looking to see if I had the box here, but um, oh wait, I do. Wait, let me get that. I know this isn't going to be as much fun for people listening, but we've got our first uh, our tabletop game. Uh, this is Cine Lucha, the board game. I can't read the right way. And it's uh, it's a card and dice game. And it's going to be, you know, it, it's it's great fun for both a family to play. You can play it, you know, two people can, can play it together, uh, working cooperatively to beat the enemy. But you can also play it one on, you know, you know, not one on one. You can play it solo by yourself. And so it's, I'm really looking forward to that. But what we're planning on doing too with that is, when you come to a Masked Mania event, um, you'll be able to sit down and play the game, you know, in the in the hour and a half before the show. And and so I think there's going to be some really unique, unique ways. That's our live event uh, experience and also our live event uh, merch stand. Awesome, Kevin. This is great. Um, as we uh, planned for, you certainly have a lot of talking points. It's all good stuff. Where. We're cheering and celebrating uh, as well. Uh, let me turn it over to John. Kev, where can everybody find you and Maxed Republic? Uh, we try to keep it very simple. Maxed Republic, M-A-S-K-E-D Republic on uh, Twitter or X, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, we also do have a com- uh, Masked Republic comics accounts. So if you are into comics, definitely check those out and follow that as well. And then... Uh, masked mania if you want to know when we might be coming to a town near you in 2025 uh at masked mania live um across social media so and then of course maskedmania.com and maskedpro.com so that's where you can find us all right awesome kevin thank you for all the time really appreciate it appreciate you guys thank you so much thanks kevin thank you kevin Awesome to get him back on. Let's hit the plugs lobby. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. What about you? On Amazon, <laughs> Trump Mania, Vince McMahon, WWE, and the making of America's 45th and what's the number now? 47th uh, president. Um, both the uh, original, there was a 2020 election special. Uh, there'd have to be a good amount of demand to uh, to do more. But on X, follow me at Lovey Marg, L-A-V-I-E, M-A-R-G. And we reached 100 members of the business of the business on uh, LinkedIn. So we did it, John. We did it. Um, so uh, we'll keep growing. Hopefully 100 is an accelerant number that you'll feel, okay, there's people here. Let, let's keep going. And that's been a fun thing to build up in a unique platform. All right, Lobby. Thank you. Thank you to Kevin Kleinrock. Thank you, everybody out there for listening. See you right back here next time for the business of the business. See you then, folks.